Hi, I'm Karen Callahan from Arts in Lundy. Welcome to our session titled Fundraising for the Future, Why It is Critical to Keep Your Foot Off the Gas, or On the Gas, I should say, and Off the Brakes. Uh, by all accounts, the last two years um, could have, and were for some, the most challenging years I think that we have experienced. And I think that's true for, um, for everyone who is on, is on this panel. Um, but in the midst of all of this, we have seen some really extraordinary um, results, stories of innovation, of generosity, of determination. And while admittedly not all schools have fared the same, some realized great gains and some encountered significant challenges. Today, we'd like to share with you examples from the former, stories of, of a few of the schools that we've worked with that had great successes and what their efforts have had in common. Representing those schools are Jeff Byrne, who is Director of Institutional Advancement at Thatcher School, Christian Sockel, who is Assistant Head of School for Institutional Giving at the Hill School, and then Taylor Stockdale, um, some of you may know him, who heads up the web schools uh, here in California. What's important to note is that one thing that they all have in common is that they were in campaigns when the pandemic arrived, so they were in some forward motion at the moment uh, that this hit. What we're going to um, spend our time talking about is what did they do? I'm going to start with, with Thatcher. Um, Jeff, we know that some of our, our clients have reported good results, in some cases even better results than they expected in terms of, of giving, but have also reported on a loss of donors. You don't line up with that uh, in the same way that others, especially with your alumni. Will you tell us what happened with your alumni over the past two year, years in terms of their participation? Yeah, actually our alumni, <laughs> and there were moments that we were terrified, um, but we actually saw increases in our, particip our participation rates. We had um, uh, our overall alumni giving percentage actually grew from 47 to 55%. Interestingly, um, our young, our gold alumni, our graduates of the last decade, actually increased um, up to 76% giving, and I can talk a little bit about that story. Um, and then our campaign actually more than doubled our, our initial goal of, uh, of $90 million. So, um, uh, so we actually, through all this, even though there are moments that we were gulping, um, ended up coming out just fine on the other side. So how did you achieve this? I mean, not only did you have COVID at play, but social justice issues and sexual misconduct claims. Yeah, and, and we're still going through some of them. You know, at the, at the beginning of the um, pandemic um, and really right in the wake of a lot of the social justice upheaval, we were going into um, our March kind of young alumni fundraising month. And we've had this great relationship with the Kate School where we've historically done a competition actually where we competed in a March magic, uh, March madness kind of takeoff where we would compete against one another and have some friendly competition. Um, but in the wake of this, we thought that the, um, the competition didn't make a lot of sense. And so we, we actually created a matching gift program that um, we had one past parent say, I will give, I think it was $20 to the food bank anytime a young alum makes a gift of any size. And it just created this great way to go out there and, um, and get in the ring um, at a time when we were nervous um, and have a story of how you could help Thatcher and help something else uh, larger than yourself. And it proved to, to really work out. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that, that, that was, you know, the driver. And we had, I mean, we had faculty making calls. We had you know, all the class reps. And it was, um, it was a great community feel good effort that, that, that um, we came out of on the other side, feel much better about all of it than we certainly went into it with, you know, a lot of apprehension. 
I'm going to turn to the Hill School for just a minute. Um, you had, Christian, two record years, uh, which is, is just astounding. Tell, tell us about what you achieved. In fiscal year 20, which would have been when COVID hit in, in sort of February, March of 20, uh, that fiscal year, we had we had the most successful overall fundraising effort at the Hill with over 20, $21 million in new gifts, pledges, estate, new estate, uh, revocable, irre, irrevocable estate commitment. So it was a it was a record year in a year where travel kind of fell off about, you know, February through June through the end of the fiscal year for us. Uh, so that was quite unexpected, but certainly, um, you know, we can get into how we achieve that. And then the next year, fiscal year 21, we actually did even better than fiscal year 20 with over 27 million in new gifts, pledges, estate commitments, and secured the, lar the largest gift in the history of the school uh, from our board chair. So um, a lot of lessons learned from that, but to have done two years in a row of record giving where travel was impeded or, or not possible, things had to move online. Um, we learned a lot certainly about how to, how to pivot and how to, how to uh, innovate, but um, we saw amazing success even in the middle of a pandemic. I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you achieved this. Is there something that really stands out for you? Yeah, two, two kind of real internal strategic decisions we made. Uh, one, in terms of annual giving, uh, we saw record giving year after year in 20 and 21. We actually reduced, reduced the number of appeals we sent and transitioned our most, most of our entire, entire appeal program online through Zoom uh, and phone or travel as able. We actually cut back on any, any kind of virtual communication outside of engaging people in individual visits. So we ended up soliciting our Leadership Giving Society almost entirely in person or in Zoom and our entire full pay parent population in Zoom or in person. Uh, so that that really allowed us to make the case for annual giving in a pandemic, which we had to really sharpen our uh, rhetoric and our communication around why the annual fund is so pivotal in a pandemic, the flexible dollar, the value of the flexible dollar in a pandemic. So that was a real big internal decision to get kind of get rid of appeals and go full fully relationship based solicitation work. And, um, and then our head of school and our board chair uh, really helped us on a lot of key individual meetings, uh, which took a lot of time uh, through Zoom primarily, uh, but we focused on our best donors. And uh, we all know that qualifying new donors was a real challenge in the pandemic, but we we focused on our best donors who ultimately, I think, made decisions around their values and what mattered. And Hill, thankfully, was part of their philanthropic matrix. And it turned that turned the momentum up even further to get us to where we needed to get to. Um, a question for you on this, because I find this so fascinating. Do you think once the world opens up and, and you are able to travel as uh, the way that you used to, do you think you might apply this same strategy or something similar to this going forward? Yeah, I mean, we've, we basically have adopted um, the less appeal mindset already. I think mm -hmm. that's going to stick with us at Hill. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying we don't do appeals, you know, you do one or two, but the reliance on them as we looked at what do appeals really generate of the overall giving, it was about 10%. So this idea of having to spend a lot of time on appeals and on design, get the, get the appeal out, it just doesn't work at the higher level of leadership annual giving. So it, it certainly means a lot more travel. It, it puts pressure on staff. It, it, it calls into question staffing. Uh, because you're going to need more gift staff or more annual giving staff. But 
I think we all know to really to really get leadership annual giving to the operating budget, you really need to be in front of your best donors to communicate why that gift matters and the impact of growing the operating budget on the overall health of the school um, is not easily understood, I don't think, um, from donors. And so the more time you can spend individually doing that, uh, I think the better. And, and that's what we, we have retained, even, th even in this year, which we see as unpredictable. Um, sure. and, uh, but we, we at Hill have always been pretty bullish on travel um we've we are traveling now uh still and i i still think you need to be out there even even in these variant situations because there are donors who will still see you um and there will will be ones who won't and zoom will be available for that but that's the new reality i think we're in and um and you've got to persevere through that thank you taylor so you had a pretty exciting announcement back in October. Tell us about that. So we we uh, actually went public with our campaign in October um, that we had been building. We were in the leadership phase for the past couple of years. We actually delayed our launch by a year from October of 2020 to 21. And uh, we, did, we were able to announce uh, a lot of good news in October including um, our largest gift in history, uh, a gift in excess of $100 million through an estate plan from an anonymous uh, alumnus. And, um, and, and really just obviously was a, a massive <laughs> kind of transformational gift and moment for Webb. Um, I've known this person for over 30 years. He's an incredible person. He dedicated the gift to his parents who, who sent him to Webb. And and a, a long time ago, and, and, and they really had to work hard for it. And he wanted to be sure every kid who had the ability and uh, wanted to be a part of the web community could do so. And so that was the gist of his, of his giving. Um, and it really, I mean, of course, it sparked a lot of other positive gifts. We've actually raised a little over $9 million since that announcement um, for a whole variety of things. So it's been sort of one of these moments that, you know, we we're in our hundredth year, we're in the middle of a centennial, we're, you know, but, but it's been tricky. I mean, it's been hard to, to get to that point in the middle of a pandemic, um, trying to build and sustain that momentum leading, leading up to that, to that big announcement. So. You know, I think every head that we work with have, has said that the last two years have been the hardest years in their career. So given that and being in a campaign, and we know how much pressure now is on heads of schools to do that, to function more like a CEO, um, how, what did you do? What, how, how did you work throughout this campaign during the pandemic? And, and how did you involve members of your team? Well, first of all, I have a, an extraordinary associate head of schools who is um, who was really uh, able to, to rise up and, and really manage the day-to-day -day situation with many of our families with online learning last year. Um, that was a huge gift. Um, and then beyond that, I think we, you know, in a sense, as they've been talking about, the pandemic was more of an accelerator. And for us, um, we had been moving in this direction, but really what it forced us to do is to develop almost a business team within our administration and to have regular meetings and a regular cadence of information between our chief advancement officer, our chief admission officer, our CFO and myself. And we really got into a sink in terms of resource allocation, including uh, tuition revenue, uh, the annual fund, uh, endowment takeout policies, capital projects, et cetera. And it's all linked together. And I think what the, what the pandemic did is it really, it really highlighted how interconnected those variables are. And I think that in a sense, it made us much better moving forward by having a, a much sharper sort of business team within the administration. That team also would, would meet, we would meet with the executive committee of the board periodically and talk about sort of nuts and bolts of how are the tuition, how's the tuition revenue, How's, you know, how is, how is the revenue generation going and, and how are we spending our, our money in terms of 
not only just the regular program, but the online resources, the testing resources, all of the sort of safety mitigations and LA County protocols that cost extra money. How do we, how do we ensure that we, we, uh, we get through the budget in, in, a, in a good way? And it really involved bringing those revenue generators to the table and developing a plan from there. So staying with you for a minute, Taylor, um, some have argued that they lost at least a year, if not two years of cultivating major donors. Mm -hmm. Is, was that your experience? Was there difficulty for you in doing that? You know, I, I, I don't think so from, for, the, for the existing donors, the parents and the alumni and Christian and Jeff have both highlighted that as well. I think we, we, we definitely continued our, our aggressive cultivation strategies. They just look, looked a little different, you know, and we, we too had lots of individual Zoom sessions with uh, prospective donors and current donors with me and the chief advancement officer or with me and the board chair. Uh, we would do at times four or five a day or at night, depending on where they lived. Um, and, uh, and I think that we did a, a good job given the circumstances of keeping everybody in the fold. Um, we were more candid, I think, than we were before. You know, the prospective donors really wanted to get under the hood and look at the finances and talk, talk, talk about the, the, the sort of stark realities of what we were facing. And I think that was refreshing, actually. I think that that's something we're going to continue to do beyond the pandemic. I think we're going to be, it's going to be something that's going to be expected. And, you know, I will say for the, for the head of school and the board chair, you know, we were on the hot seat <laughs> more than we were used to, but it made us a better place, actually, um, ultimately. Um, so I think that for the existing uh, members of our community, we did a, we did a good job of, of staying in front of people via Zoom and in person when we could. The new families coming in, that was more of a challenge and it remains more of a challenge. You know, we've done everything we can do through Zoom and, you know, we have international students, we have students from all over the globe. Um, I'm usually um, traveling quite a bit, you know, to meet them personally. Of course, I've not been able to do that. So we've been doing our best to sort of forge those partnerships and relationships, but it, has, it, it hasn't been quite the same. I mean, I think we've, we, we know that and, and we have plans for making up for lost time once Omicron finally uh, runs its course. But I think that's been a really challenging aspect. The, the giving has continued to increase, but I, I'm also concerned about the next two to three years to be sure that those incoming families feel like they're, 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 in, they're investing in something that they're really a part of. And I think that's something that we're just gonna have to really focus on. Yeah, I think that's true for many. Christian, um, I know that your head of school and board chair were, were really involved in your board chair in a pretty unique way. Will you share that with us? Sure. So we, we have the unique, I think, blessing to have had, and he has since retired just this new fiscal year. But for the past several years, the board chair offered his time to travel with our staff. Uh, not just myself, but our entire gift officer staff. So we created a program, I <clears throat> nicknamed it the Emissary Program, where our board chair would travel with our gift officers and myself at least monthly uh, on, our, on our trips. So he'd, he'd go with me to California, or he'd go with one of the other gift officers to Texas, whatever the case may be. And we would reach out to our donors and ask them to please meet with me and the board chair to talk about, you know, their support of the school. And at first we started with kind of all ranges of donors. And then we, we got a little more targeted with the top end of the gift pyramid. And we executed that for a number of years, which as we all know, the relationships strengthen and then you get lightning to strike and it happens, you know, maybe it's in the pandemic and, and some of that did happen as a result of our success for the last two years. Um, our head of school, same thing, uh, very aggressive in fundraising, uh, not afraid to ask and, uh, and be bold and be out there. So we also would pair him with our gift staff and myself. So we really tried to be pretty egalitarian in terms of having the head or the board chair with a gift officer to move a relationship 
not just have it have to be me, which really strengthened the gift officers, got them really good at being in meetings. They get to see the head perform. They see the board chair perform. They get better, uh, stronger, um, and see some really great success, which of course leads to retention, in my opinion. And they want to stay at a place where they can share the million dollar gifts and not just have it be always the head of advancement. In the pandemic, we took that same traveled schedule and we just moved it to Zoom. So it might be, uh, all right, well, I would have gone to California next week, but I can't travel due to COVID. So we're just going on Zoom. And it's California week in Zoom with the board chair. And so we just kept the visit schedule throughout the entire pandemic. So, you know, we would end up having an emissary trip like every other week with either the head or the board chair. And that sustained momentum to lead to these record years of annual giving and uh, overall campaign giving because we do these major annual fund asks in these meetings with the board chair right there or the head of school right there. And that's how we uh, we adapted and, and used them to our benefit. And they, they've made the time. They made the time to do it. And, um, and that's what led largely to our success. Wow. Hey, Christian, um, just on a kind of tactical level, how do those Zoom, like, like are, you, are you walking through a PowerPoint with, with those? Or are you, uh, is there kind of a, a script that you guys pretty much all go through or is it much more kind of one-off and custom based on the gift officer or, the, or who's in the, in the room? Yeah, the gift officer, so so the gift officer and myself, we set the meeting up. We set the, obviously, the date, the time. We do what's called a prelude. So we'll tell the donor in advance, here are the three or four things we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk to you about your annual fund gift. I'm going to tell you how the school is responding to COVID. And I want to tell you about our new tennis facility we want to build because we know you played or something like that. And we'll show you some renderings. So the Zoom, you know, Zoom is great then because you can pull up the renderings, you can show a video. It's so much better than like pulling the iPad out at a lunch in a restaurant. Yeah. yeah. So like in one way, Zoom is is so great because in one, like I found it actually compresses the meeting into the most important things because a lot of people don't want an hour of Zoom and to socialize really. They're kind of like, yeah, just tell me get to the point, make the case, let's go. So we, we don't, we did not wing it in Zoom. Uh, and we're, we're quite structured. And, you know, when you have the head of school's time or the board chair's time, you, you need to make it uh, impactful. So it was, it was pretty buttoned up. Um, but I, I really like Zoom in that sense, because you can really bring the donor right to the case uh, or maybe even, you know, we, we actually would, in some cases, walk them through the building on campus through Zoom uh, as if they were there on a tour. So we, we really tried to get creative around using Zoom to our benefit. Yeah, the other thing I found, Christian, is, um, and Jeff, probably you've seen this too, is it's easier to get spouses or partners together. Mm -hmm. It's almost right. impossible, you know, during a visit to get people you know everyone in, in one room but on zoom it it's been a lot more of a partnership with with people right. because they're able to access it a lot easier by the or way bring a, just to bring a faculty bring a faculty member in yeah there you go exactly mm -hmm. yeah. so effect so so effective there um if done if done well christian i just want to underline that 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 advanced email that you send um to kind of set the agenda right is it like it it, it I think just puts everyone at ease and it also yeah. makes you accountable for the agenda. <laughs> like you right. actually, you can't not get there. Cause you're going to say, I, I, one of my real mentors, my first board chair at Middlesex guy named Jimmy Oates, he, he, I would travel. I, I was lucky similar to the, what you've set up with your staff where I was a, you know, I was a 24 year old kid and I got to travel with the board chair and it was just so great to learn, you know, mm -hmm. and start to grow, you know, professionally. Um, but he used to always sit down when he said like, okay, Taylor, so good to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. I want to hear about you. I want to hear what's going on with your job. I want to hear how your kids are doing. I got to talk to you about these like three things at Middlesex that we're trying to do. So I want to go through those things, but let's just start with how you're doing. Right. And, and it would just be like, 
it just, it worked, <laughs> you know, it was just yeah. this very easy thing of setting the agenda and taking control of the meeting right. and, um, and, and then holding yourselves accountable to actually talk about the things that you need to talk about. And no surprises. Yeah. yeah. Right. Hey, Jeff, you, you were thrown a few curveballs, um, you know, during, especially during the last couple of years, what, what are some of the biggest surprises you experienced? Oh, I've got surprise. I mean, <laughs> so, so I was talking to someone the other day. I was like, "Well, at least you're battle tested." Uh, um, you know, I, I so we, yeah, as we all know here in California, we we were we dealt with wildfires. Our wildfires came, you know, twenty feet from our barns here. We had mudslides that followed that. I had personnel. I, I had my. I had a husband wife major gift team. Um, I had, the husband um, had an aneurysm a week before we went public. And that was my major, those were my, those were my two major gift officers. So it took him out and took his wife out because she became the caregiver. As you mentioned, I, we've had a really challenging sexual misconduct case. Um, we had a head of school transition right in the middle of the campaign. Um, we had an unexpected and, and controversial board chair transition. Um, and that's not even COVID. Like COVID's like down on the list of the things that we had to deal with. And, you know, it just is a, you know, kind of amazing that if you can still get through it, right? It's just, you know, if any one of if you, any one of these things you say ahead of time, like, you know, you get by that, like, oh, that will be tough, but you just, you just do it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we have, um, we have so many people reaching out to us about the great resignation and, and what they're experiencing. How about, how about the three of you? Have you experienced that? I mean, I have from a faculty staff standpoint, I think we're doing pretty well, but definitely there is that maybe the challenge with us is more a bit of an a la carte desire for, for the workplace more, you know, and, and independent schools tend to be all in type places. And so we're getting more and more special requests and, and, and whatnot from our really great faculty members and staff members, but we, we're having to be a lot more flexible in terms of how we look at people's workloads, et cetera. And, um, you know, in the health center and in, uh, in advancements, certainly, um, everybody's looking for advancement great people. So you're always, you just always have to be aware of that and, uh, and be as competitive as, as possible and ensure that you're meeting their needs, not only financially, but also their career aspirations and doing everything you can to help support things on the home front for them so that it's a manageable position, so. We're not having the real resignation right now. We're having um, uh, people interested in 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 more flexible work arrangements. Mm -hmm. It's just really challenging for me as an older, as someone who grew up in a face-to-face -face management role to think about how do we manage um, electronically. Um, and some of, some of what I've learned around that has been really helpful. I, I, we moved much more to accountability metrics rather than like did you show up at eight and leave at five right um so i think that's been really helpful what we're having uh, taylor mentioned it briefly there is just like finding advancement we used to have you know three four five six finalists and now you know for for any position and now just finding people who will apply for a job right now is mm -hmm. Is hard, like, like just the, the pool of talent seems much thinner to me right now than it's been. Well, and I also think the other advancement, I mean, USC, UCLA, all the UCs really, I'm here at the Claremont Colleges and everybody's in campaign, everybody's hiring. Yeah. So that just adds to the pressure in terms of advancement people. Yeah. Christian, I know you have a rather innovative approach. Yeah. Uh, so we, our gift staff right now are with us um, the, at the least four years now and in some cases seven uh, so we've been able to retain our entire gift staff for between four and seven years currently part of its culture building I, I agree with both Jeff and Taylor that you've you've got to I think we rely on the metrics as Jeff said I'm not tracking are you here today and what, when did you come in and when are you leaving but the numbers don't lie you either doing the visits and getting the gifts or you aren't and I think as the as leadership, you know, we we want that flexibility, I think, and we give that to our staff because of 
the unpredictability of life, but the work still needs to get done. And I think Zoom helps that a little because you can do it a little bit from home. But what I tell the staff is we are still a school that is in the business of people. Uh, so we can't be remote forever. Uh, and that's not good for our office. That's not good for our culture. Um, and that, you know, so I think you, we've always had to strike that balance. One thing we do on the compensation and benefits side is we've developed an incentive-based bonus program for our gift officers that's been in place for at least five years now. And it's, um, it's paid on an annual basis. It's based on uh, a gift officer's ability to hit an annual fund goal, uh, a capital or endowment giving goal, and then and that's individually. And then they as a group compete together for the largest gift of the year bonus. So we, we've developed that program. Uh, it, it is surprising uh, that money doesn't motivate them as I, cause we survey them, we talk to them about, you know, why do you stay? And they, it's not because they can get a bonus. It's largely around culture in the office and um, gratitude, uh, appreciation for the work, exposure to the head and the board chair, flexibility, you know, money, money matters to a degree, but um, we're in a, we're in a small sort of, semi-urban uh, blue collar town in Pottstown, Pennsylvania. So the, the, the ability to pay well is, is not there because the market doesn't support it. Um, so through the incentive-based program, we've been able to add as much as 10,000 a year to a, a gift officer's base salary, which can be the difference uh, for them in terms of leaving us for a bigger school down near Philadelphia, for example. So we've used the incentive program to keep people, uh, but it's just part of the formula uh, for us in terms of competing with the other schools who are trying to recruit them away. So I, I think you have to, if you can, address it from, the, I'll say, the money side and the, the emotional side uh, and try and balance both of those uh, competing interests sometimes. Yeah, I think, I just think it's remarkable that you had your gift officer stay for, for as long as you have, um, yeah. especially with, I know how much, how much you invest in their training. Right. And so it's, uh, it's a tough thing to invest in that and then have them scooped by the mm -hmm. school down the road. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, to the three of you, what, what do you think will be changed forever going forward? One thing I think that has, from my experience, emerged is the importance of estate charitable giving conversations. I think the pandemic has revealed that, that everyone, the people we're dealing with become very introspective about what they value and maybe even what their legacy is going to be. Um, and I know we've been talking a lot about annual giving and major gifts, but I think there's a lot of action and opportunity in estate charitable giving mm -hmm. at all levels, parents, alumni. And we've seen a considerable increase in plan giving discussions, uh, willingness for donors to step forward and document things. Um, then on, from a stewardship perspective, you can steward that gift while they're alive so that they feel good about it um, at their passing. Uh, or they may even convert it to a cash gift instead of an estate gift. So I think that has changed the landscape, in my view, positively, because that used to be, in some cases, sort of taboo or really tough work. Uh, but I think that this has helped unlock that as a component part of, of campaigns. Yeah. And Taylor can say that it pays off. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'll count. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think the other thing for me, for me, it's a great question, Karen. It's like the deepest of questions, right? Right now, what's going to remain? I think that more and more, our constituencies are going to hold us to a higher standard in how we how we develop a public purpose for our schools that extends beyond just our our students and our parents and our, I mean, the, the thing that Jeff talked about with the soup kitchen matching donation, 
is just a small example, but a very meaningful example of that and how your young alumni responded to that at like 75% participation, which is shatters all the records. Um, I think that our, our parents and alumni are going to insist that we do, you know, walk the walk, walk the walk in terms of making our communities better. And they're 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 really going to be insisting upon that before they are supporting us. Like, what do you do beyond just the, the students who are there to make the world better, to make your communities better, et cetera? Um, I also think the I, I agree with the estate giving discussions. We've definitely seen an increase there. And and also um, I think that just being willing to be more candid with our prospective donors and our donors about you know the business end of things and and what what we're doing and what what, what our challenges are, um, I think that's going to continue to be to be the case, and I think it's going to make us better as a result of that. I mean, I don't think we'll do this, but um, I think we should do what Christian's group did and um, get rid of appeals and talk talk to people in person. Um, I think anything that we can do to have appeals be the last option rather than everything that we, you know, it's like, you do need them to clean up some stuff, but like, you know, most of us, you know, who are at this conference work at small schools and we do have the ability to reach most people. Right. And we should, you know, we're not university of Michigan trying to get to hundreds of thousands of alumni. Like we, we can actually get to, our people and you know if we could move away from appeals and more to more to in-person relationship-based giving and and actually be you know you know i think a lot of our places from a from a math problem would should be hiring more gift officers um but culturally we can't do it because you just can't have you know there's just challenges to how many develop but like if you just maybe reframe it a little, I'm thinking out loud here, but with like, these are relationship managers. These are not just gift officers. These are the people who are connecting people from all walks of life to our places and our, our, our external relationship team, um, rather than an appeal, especially as you know, people aren't picking up their mail or reading their emails. Um, it may, we may be forced to do this. That's, that's, that's such a great point. Karen, there's yeah. one other, Karen, one other, Yeah. this is like te real technical, but I think it is, it is something that I'm just noticing. I would just say, given the tremendous growth in the stock market, so it was like at 17,000 in March of 2020, it's now at 35, so it's doubled. Uh, and a lot of people did well in the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, and probably a lot of our donors I think the emergence of donor advised funds and required minimum distribution, charitable, qualified charitable distribution is where a lot of action is as well. That there is a lot of major gift activity in that range because that age group, they're in their 50th reunions, they're in their 55th reunions, they're retired, they, they possibly have doubled their net worth in the in the pandemic and i've just seen at hill at least an increase in gifts from donor advised funds and the mark the proper marketing of the rmd and the qualified charitable distribution works yeah. uh, and a lot of a lot of donors don't know about it necessarily or think of it as an easy way to make an annual fund gift <laughs> because they have to take it anyway. Um, so we've used that as a, a little bit of a, well, you don't give anyway, and you have to take the, the distribution, why not make an annual fund gift? Um, and use that in a reunion setting, because you can kind of get the committee to back you on it. But I think that has changed uh, considerably and, and would be where staff could develop, devote some time in the next two two to three years, presuming there's not a major crash in, in the market. It's, this is more, that's more sort of tactical in the weeds, but I, I think it's a new growth opportunity in terms of major gifts. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, and with the, a population that's a little bit younger too than what you identified, we're, we're seeing right. like significantly elevated gifts right. um, given through that. So forecasting out, 
This is what everyone wants to know. What, what, what's it going to be like over the next two to three years? I know you could make a lot of money if you can forecast this really accurately, but tell me what your thoughts are. I mean, you must be thinking already to where do we go from here? What are we going to do next? What do you think it's going to be like? Well, I, I think you're going to have to still be on all these platforms, text, email, phone, Zoom, and visits. I think where it was taboo a few years ago in text is now regular. What mm -hmm. might have been weird and awkward in Zoom is now commonplace. I, I don't know what new platform there might be, but I think the ability to be able to function in all those platforms really well in relationship building and maintenance of relationships yeah. is uh, is is where this is going to be maybe forever um and i think you, this having staff really good and uh able to run in those platforms and adapt it, as well as us as leaders is um is where at least the next two or three years in my view is where it's going to be. What do you think, Jeff? Um, <laughs> there's going to be another surprise. Uh, <laughs> just don't know what it is. And um, it'll be scary to get back in the ring. And we have oh. to, I think is the, I think what, you know, we've just been rewarded for, for, um, continuing at it and it, and there there are moments especially when you're dealing with people who aren't doing this this isn't their full-time job they'll all tell you not to fundraise in this environment um and um i think we have to have the confidence in what in our core beliefs about this work and the importance of this work and and the need to be relationship based and the need to keep at it like if we don't do it it won't happen um and and all of our schools need need this work to go on. So um, I think, unfortunately, we're just, there'll be another surprise and we got to keep at it. I want to just add to what Jeff said, because I think there are donors who are waiting for us to ask. Yeah. Your best people are, are actually waiting for you to reach out and say, uh, we need your help or how can we help uh, versus holding, holding back. So I think donors sharpen their values, sharpen, they, they shrink perhaps their giving matrix. Uh, but if you're in the top two, three, four, you're, you're still going to be benefiting from that. But um, I totally agree. In fact, it's time to lean in, not to pull back. Yeah. Uh, and, it, and it won't just fall out of the tree. Right. Like they do need to be, we, yeah. we talk here a lot, like action gets reaction. Right. right? And, um, and I couldn't agree with you more. And if they're not going to do it on their own for whatever reason, right? They do right. need to be asked. Right. And, and just sort no. of go ahead, Taylor. As I say, put, uh, adding to that, I agree with all of that. And I think the what's driving it is I feel like during this pandemic, what we value in independent schools, you know, what we value in our communities and in our cultures and our relationships has become even more uh, important to people. Like it's sort of what we represent has emerged as sort of uh, something that's gonna be even more desired and more, more important for families moving forward. And again, I, I'm far from being Pollyannish uh, in general, but I do think that the independent school community um, is when, when what we stand for and our relational qualities and our human connections, uh, that's going to be more and more sought after. And I think our, our prospective donors and our current donors are going to want to support that even more. That's what I'm finding. I think both of you are exactly right. You know, it needs to be relationship based and they're not going to come necessarily um, out to you. You have to lean in, you have to be in front of them. But once you are, I, I, feel, I feel like they're more receptive than ever. Because they know how important this work is, they know what a what a, what 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 a magical moment it can be with a with an incredible faculty member and a couple of students in a robotics lab or 
or in some sort of a debate tournament or in an athletic center or you know even just in a in a regular wonderful classroom um, they understand I think the richness of that and at the same time I mean I think we've all seen the the opposite of that and that is you know after coming out of this pandemic and the online world you know we're we're looking at the a lot of the socioeconomic or socio um, emotional deficits that that our students had at the beginning of the year and and just realizing how important the human connections are so I feel like, yes, there will be definitely a surprise or two. Absolutely. The show must go on. And I feel like what we represent on our missions have never been more important. And they're never, they're never going to be more valued by our, by our donor base. Well, I think we might be getting a signal that we're near the end of our time. But so thank you, all three of you, for doing this. Um, you've had a, a remarkable couple of years and I, I think many, and I hope many on this will benefit from that. So to all who joined the session, thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions that weren't answered or you just wanna keep the conversation going, we'll share our email and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.